as we continue to hop around in the New Testament, highlighting different examples of what is unique about the gathering and community of the ones who follow Jesus, we find ourselves in the book of James. Now, James is most well known for his theological thesis, faith without works is dead. Indeed, his letter revolves around seemingly a singular argument concerning the necessity of translating convictions into action. That if we have a conviction in our heart, it can only be really true if it's lived out in James's seeing and reading of the world. In addition to the argument he makes, we note undertones, overtones, and ground-level tones, just tones, of the letter as, as having a lot of fire and passion within it. James is frustrated with some kind of specific situation or situations that are occurring in these churches and in the early church. And yet, the message he has had almost two millennia of staying power, speaking to the heart of issues that the church has faced in every age, including our very own. Of interest for the section that is our focus for this morning is that good works, that James, uh, this phrase that we hear, in James's mind, good works cannot be reduced to something like just random acts of kindness. Good works is more than just holding the door for someone at the convenience store or uh, helping people across the street. But good works, it doesn't exclude those things, but good works are manifest in the very nature of the church's composition, polity, and even its seating arrangements, as he says in our example for today. James gives an impassioned argument against the show of favoritism within the assembly towards those who appear to be better off by worldly standards of wealth and beauty. If the church, James says, proclaims to follow the Jesus who heals the sick and unclean, who calls sinners, those who are considered to be sinners, in his, into his very ministry, who tells stories as audacious as the Good Samaritan to get his point across, then how could the church seem to be so concerned or preoccupied with signs of status and wealth? This is what he's seeing in front of him in this context. And James is coming in strong with these, with these words. But he links his argument back to the very same Shema of the Old Testament that both the Samaritan and the religious officials and all of the hearers of Jesus in our story from last week had heard very clearly in their religious upbringing. The Shema, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul, your being, then you will love your neighbor. The bottom line is that an active faith requires consistent love that is outwardly expressed in the world. For the early church, one of the places in which the deeds of faith played out and were more than just played out, but were embodied by the very gathering, was at mealtimes. Many early church gatherings were centered around the table, were centered around the meal itself. We often talk about dinner church as this new innovation that co has come back into vogue. Well, I say come back into vogue. That's come into popularity lately, but it's really coming back to the roots of how the church originally gathered. They had no pews, but they did have a table around which the friends gathered. And so... One's seating position at the table, especially in their cultural context, indicated one's status, favor among the group, or lack thereof these things. The Apostle Paul, for instance, throughout his letters, often has scathing criticisms of churches that meet to eat, as he says, unworthily. Because those who are, and what he means by unworthily is that those who are wealthy, sit at one end of the table and eat a plentiful and extravagant meal and others on the poor end of the table eat meager rations or nothing at all. 
all in the same gathering. In a somewhat theologically rare harmony between James and Paul, James is often, we refer to him as the guy who likes good works, we refer to Paul as the one that says, faith alone is what saves you, not your works, but yet they come and identify and agree on this thing. They both identify this kind of inequality in the church as a body to be an ultimate failure of living out their faith. How could the church be doing the work of Jesus, they ask, of tearing down earthly boundaries, these topics we've talked about the last few weeks, when they are separated at their very own tables or at their very own gatherings? This is such an important thread in the development of our faith tradition that it informs some of our most core theologies, even how we approach the communion table in the United Methodist Church. This idea of eating together in a fashion that is worthy, so to speak, is a major reason that we are very intentional about saying that we, and hopefully embodying, that we have an open table at communion. Christ's table is not reserve, isn't a private reserve for the elite among us, but has a place for all who hunger and thirst for the love that Jesus offers, that mind-blowing and healing experience. As much as faith and society and people change over the years, much of the basic struggles of human life together remain similar. Still, we have much to reflect on in the book of James. And whether it's within the church or in our general life together, society as a whole, I'm sure these words from James call to mind situations in the world we see around us. And as an example that is meant to be somewhat humorous, but have elements of truth into it, I recall once a mentor of mine, Pastor Fish, Harold Salmon, from Lumberton, North Carolina, giving me one of those not-taught-in-seminary crash courses, pulling me aside before one of the most unassuming yet dangerous, he would say, activities for a pastor, the church potluck. This was especially true in our context in the South, like the South. Oh, for sure, and for sure, there is a lot of beauty. There's a huge beauty in each family bringing something that they love to contribute to the palate of the greater church body. Like, we all bring little pieces of ourselves and our homes and our traditions, and together they become all of ours. And all together we gather to share the best of us in community. And that is beautiful. But, Harold would say, be careful, young pastor. And he was speaking particularly to me in a pastoral context. Be careful what you put on your plate. Try just a dab of everything you can fit on it. And Lord help you if you get some of Gertrude's glazed carrots but skip over Mr. Quinn's. And be polite, but careful not to overpraise or overcritique the taste of the food, because they are listening, and they'll be talking about it at the next small group. And go through the line last. It's the humble thing to do. The first shall be last and all of that. But it also gives you culpable deniability. You know, I'm sorry, I didn't get to the pickled eggs in time. They were all gone by the time I got through there. And it helps also solve the predicament of who to sit with. Often you just go where there's a chair available and try to change up who you sit with from t as well. Eating last also gives you, I have found, it's very practical, it also gives you uh, a chance to talk with everybody else while they're getting their food, and then once you're ready to eat... You can do so without getting up every five seconds to go talk to somebody else. It's very helpful. Now, a lot of this is tongue-in-cheek, but speaks to some of the elements that go on in just our corporate gatherings. Corporate gatherings and meals may not be as ubiquitous culturally or in the life of the church, especially in the post-COVID uh, gathering times, but we still have a number of ways that we can be embodying the welcome of love of and love of neighbor, or ways that we might not be doing that. 
Indeed, the book of James still gives us much to be aware of in how we not only live out this, way, this faith in specific actions that we think of, but how we embody this faith and love of neighbor in the very gatherings that we, the very ways that we gather, and the different ways that we embody this faith that we proclaim. And so, my friends, we gather today. We share these tables today. We bring some of the best of us. And we, imbo- and we seek to embody the love of neighbor in the food that we share and the company that shares it. Let us pray. Gracious one, we pray that you will help us as a congregation embody the best of what this community of faith that has pursued your love and how to love in the way that love is an active noun like struggle is. That we pursue and wrestle with the best ways to embody your love, even with the challenges that we face. And we pray that as you welcome us to your table, you will wel- help us to welcome one another and to share this, the table of fellowship together, taking the communion of the sacrament that we celebrate once a month and living it out in the sharing of this meal. God, we pray that you'll help us to see you in the eyes and the being of each person we, excuse me, that we share the table with. Lord God, we pray that you are with us with this meal and with this congregation as we continue to seek out the way to seek out and be thoughtful of the ways we embody your love in the world. We ask this all in the name of your Son, Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.